good afternoon, folks. Um, thanks for joining our session. Uh, we'll do a brief intro here. Andrew's here. Uh, and what we're going to do today, description of the session, bare metal um, UPI. So just to clarify what we're going to do today, it is OKD. And Andrew's going to go uh, using a Linux with libvirt kvm how to get a v4 installed on such a linux box so that's just to clarify um bare metal often gets used and okay open shift to kind of a agnostic platform install so this is agnostic you just in the sense that you run it on any linux but it's not on the how usually people think of bare metal, right? The hardware, pizza boxes, not meant to be, uh, just to clear. Uh, so our goals today is we, we will show the actual call using a Linux. Um, Andrew has, uh, I think you said for 33, Andrew. So we'll, we'll show that. Um, and then we'll, there's lots of, um, recommendations and gotchas. Uh, Andrew, Andrew was chatting me today. He um, finally saw a lot of uh, things that he probably will share with you um, in, in getting this working. And then we'll wrap up with some Q&A from you all about your questions about spinning up or in this way. So Andrew, do you want to do a, a brief bio intro? Sure. Do you want to use the slides that we have for that, or not see my slides progressing? I do not know. I'm still looking Is... at the title slide. Really? Oh shoot! I asked if it was progressing. Let me. Let's try this again. It's a good thing we're not a technology company. <laughs> okay, I tried to let me just share and try to share. So folks, this is the first time either of us are using. So uh, we're kind of learning as we go. Let me try this again. How about now? John, I, I agree. This is, it's a whole new experience for sure. I'm, I'm no. just seeing a black screen, Justin. Jeez. It has a, this platform has a lot of potential. Um, I, I like the separation of the stage and the sessions. I like how everybody can break out and there's chat for everything. But um, I don't know if it's just unfamiliar or slightly glitchy or, but it's, it's been an exercise. To say the least dry run of this. Oh, I can see that, Justin. I you can? can? Yeah, your, your browser is as it is now. Okay, so if I present, let's see what happens. Do you see yourself now? Take a, a second or two to load. Still a loading screen for me, but I know what I look like. Mm. Now I will I, 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 uh, and do you mind trying to reshare because your team to work in. Yeah, I'll go ahead and share. So if you want yeah, to this, unshare, I'll stop. And let me do this again. Oops. Of course, of I I do not have these issues in all the major ones, the major culprits like WebEx and what not? All right. I see your screen. Hopefully you see a picture of me now. Yep. All right. So apologies for the, uh, the rough starts, uh, such as life sometimes with technology and especially with uh, streaming platforms. 
Um, so I am Andrew Sullivan. I am a uh, technical marketing manager with the Red Hat Cloud Platforms business unit. Uh, so my day job is really focused around OpenShift uh, and broadly speaking, OpenShift on various virtual platforms as well as OpenShift being a virtual platform. So OpenShift virtualization, Kubert, that type of stuff. Uh, so there's some contact information there. Anybody is always welcome to reach out to me, andrew.sullivan at redhat.com or via Twitter. Uh, I also have a weekly live stream on openshift.tv. It's the Ask an OpenShift Administrator office hour. Uh, so that happens Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, so anybody's welcome to stop by. Right? We have a whole bunch of different topics. Last week we talked about ETCD. This week we talked about uh, VMware, OpenShift on VMware. Uh, so uh, always a good time and please don't hesitate to uh, stop by and, and chat if you'd like. And I'll hand over to you, Justin. Okay, thanks. Um, Justin here again, the, the guy that has the glitchy screen share. By the way, um, Andrew's uh, demos are really awesome. Um, do, do you have a, a direct link to those streams on your on your Twitter feed? Like, can people get them there? Um, I usually don't link them on Twitter. They're all on the re uh, OpenShift YouTube. Um, so if you just go to, or, or openshift.tv, if you go to openshift.tv, you'll find links to Twitch as well as to YouTube where they're all at. Um, yeah, John on OpenShift YouTube. Um, we're, we're working on, we have a, an intern who will be starting in the next few weeks who is going to work on automating the process of creating playlists for all of our different uh, streams and all of the other metadata and stuff that's going on there. So hopefully it'll get a lot easier to find them in the future. Awesome. Because you mentioned that I, I had to follow up so people would know. Good thing John uh, has, is already familiar with them. They, they are really extremely beneficial um, just to, to see you and others. Because there's a, a bunch of others who also go on there too, just uh, demoing the, the technology live. So um, I'm Justin. Uh, Pittman, you, you can find the links there on my LinkedIn. I've been in tech for a while. What I do for Red Hat is uh, I currently do enablement for our partner sales. So um, if if you know any of our partners, it could be F5 or Dynatrace or uh, Dell. Um, I'm usually involved in those types of opportunities for our technology. And then at home, I use uh, a bunch of stuff like um, that's not necessarily Red Hat productized, but might be upstream, like uh, I'll use Overt or something like that in my home lab. Anyway, good to be here with, with you all. Do you still want me to kind of go through a couple of things, Andrew, if you, if you want some last minute prep? Uh, all um, I need is the... I, I think I'm good if... We and, uh, you know, whenever we want to go and demo, um, if you want to cover any of the other material around um, kind of the overall flow or anything like that, uh, that's that's completely up to you. And I can talk yep. to you as well. Let, let's do that. So if you go one slide forward, I th oh, people don't need that. In the next slide. Let's do the next slide. Oh, that's going to make <laughs> it's animated. I forgot that. <laughs> The moder Here we go. So this we thought it would be good to give a visual. If you're familiar with OKD or Kubernetes, this may look somewhat familiar to you. But look, let's just describe that for anyone watching it live here or in recording. So OKD and Kubernetes in general, they, they do have certain external dependencies, whether you're trying to access a application that's hosted inside the cluster and you need that application to be uh, routable, that's the first thing, through, let's say, a load balancer, and the client can only get to it through DNS resolution, right? The, a lot of those components, um, especially at scale, will be done externally from the cluster. So to help us today, um, Andrew and I talked about how best to kind of demonstrate those external dependencies. So one way to do it is what we call a helper node. Um, actually, one of Andrew's peers, uh, Christian Hernandez, initially came up with the idea of this helper node that has 
a bunch of these external dependencies as services. So it comes with a load balancer as HA proxy. It has a DHCP service installed on it. It has a, a DNS uh, server installed on it. And so it has all of this very quickly built out through Ansible playbooks. So you don't have to build out each and install each of these services uh, just to get the external dependencies done. So um, we'll have a link at the end so that you can get to the Ansible playbooks for the helper node. Uh, it, it usually really simplifies the process for building out. Um, Andrew, did you want to mention that Libvirt does have a subset of these services now? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that when I start going through and showing how everything is configured in my lab um, and talk about some of the alternatives as well. Okay, all right. So after the helper node, uh, the basic workflow, if you could go forward one, Andrew, just one slide, thank you. The, the basic workflow for what we call um, a user provisioned infrastructure, which is a nice kind of way to say, bring your own, bring your own infrastructure. Um, the workflow is you, you will use the installer and you have to feed that installer um, several different pieces of information about how you want the cluster to operate. So a big one is the operating system for the nodes. So in this case for OKD, it's Fedora Core OS is the operating system for the nodes. So there needs to be some image available uh, that the install can in, in, ingest basically and or have available. So this gets back to the helper node. Where do you put these images um, if, for example, you can't download them? Like maybe you have a bit of a restricted network in some way or you need to configure the boot up process like we're going to do here. Andrew's going to show you. Well, you can store those on a web server. So the image gets stored on a web server that is uh, on the helper node, accessible from the uh, bootstrap node that will then ingest and download that Fedora CoreOS image, right? That's just one part of the flow. This diagram is, is meant to help you kind of visualize that is one piece of how, how a node gets its initial operating system. Other pieces of the installation are pretty detailed. Um, and and documented elsewhere. We have some links about those documents. But basically, there's a couple of things like the ignition config about how those uh, machines are supposed to boot up inside the cluster. Um, and those can be uh, manipulated. But the installer does generate those ignition configs as well. So that's why this is visually is presented here. But the big thing to remember is uh, for now, <laughs> uh, meaning OKD, 4.7, a bootstrap node will be spun up first. So you'll you'll see that in the demo today that the bootstrap node comes up first. Uh, it pulls down uh, things like the ignition config, any kernel boot parameters, um, and the the operating system image that's needed. So just trying to give people a workflow here. The first time you see an uh, a OKD or OpenShift install without any visual diagram of what's going on, it gets rather confusing or lost, at least personally, I find. I don't know your opinion on that, Andrew. You've done so many of them. Maybe it's like, <laughs> it's so easy for you now. But for newbies, I kind of think that it's helpful to understand, okay, you have the installer binary, but there's some other things that are needed, like a uh, node OS image, and you need other things that need to be ingested by the install or generated by the install, like ignition configs. It's just have, helping people visualize that process. Any other thoughts about that, Andrew? You yeah, I, I usually, you know, for people who aren't familiar with the OpenShift install process, it's definitely non-traditional or, or unconventional, if you will. And really the biggest thing to remember or to understand is that we're really, when we do OpenShift install, when we do all these other things, basically we're setting up the prerequisites. So all the things that the cluster is gonna need like DNS, right? And an HTTP server so it can access the resources it needs. And then we create those ignition configs. And when we turn on the nodes, they read in that ignition and then basically it instantiates and self configures itself. 
So once you get to the point of doing like the OpenShift install wait for commands, basically you're just waiting to check in on its status and see what's going on and all that other stuff. So yeah, John, it, it's both better and worse than Ansible. Um, I, <laughs> I, I like it better because- Is that, is that referenced uh, back to OKD and OpenShift 3? The Ansible install scripts, yeah. I, I assume. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so for people don't don't know the the previous version used Ansible to do this, but now four does not. Yeah, it was a, a huge, you know, it, oh, the OpenShift three or OKD three, um, you know, install process was basically a huge set of Ansible playbooks, which was really nice because well, Ansible is familiar to most everybody at this point. And you could easily go in and troubleshoot and look at the nodes and find logs and see what's going on. And, you know, they were rel nodes, so you could easily connect to them and, and see all of that. With four, it switched to where now it's CoreOS, right? So Fedora CoreOS is harder to connect to, if you will, right? There's only key-based authentication. It's only there after ignition has run, um, you know, a lot of stuff like that. And it's just meant to be, you know, they, they dramatically reduced the scope of the installer. Whereas with three, the installer was responsible for, you know, it, basically you handed it the rel nodes and then it would go through and it would deploy Docker at the time. And then it would deploy Kubernetes and then it would deploy like on and on and on and on and on and on and on, including things like the logging service and the metric service and all that. With four, they changed the installer so that it's only responsible for basically getting the cluster up and running. And then everything after that is a day two. So the installer is much more successful or more frequently successful, I should say. Uh, but it can be more difficult to troubleshoot if you're not familiar with it. And we, we've done a couple of streams about that. I'll touch on some of those things inside of here. Um, you know, fingers crossed it will go well and we won't have to do a lot of troubleshooting. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll show- Andrew was, was troubleshooting uh, late into the evening. I, 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 I saw those messages uh, late, um, but th this is the nature of, I think the sometimes if it's a latest build, right? Which I think is what you bumped into uh, last night, and, and a couple others that are in the other sessions here uh, today that they bumped into similar issues with the latest builds. But you know that's what happens when you're Fedora Core OS instead of the downstream like Rel Core OS. Um, I don't think that you know. Speaking speaking of the demo, Andrew, maybe we we jump to that. The the next slide. Um, I don't want to bore people with slides, right? The next slide we can always come back to later. Actually, you know, the recommended sizing, do, do you mind just, let's go to the recommended sizing first, just so people understand. Yeah, so um, there was some discussion, if people didn't see it in chat earlier, that you could get a single node OKD on 16 gig. All right, now uh, I have tried single node uh, on my laptop, the 16 gig. It really, um, you better not have anything else running, basically, right? Um, so it is possible. But uh, the, what you're seeing now are the recommended specs for a, a fuller cluster. And we kind of added, I kind of just threw this together, added it up for you. This is like double 16 gig, right? If you're going to have more than one node. Um, and Andrew's box, I believe, is even bigger than this, right? I think you, you have a yeah. even bigger box. So, uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but effectively, it's a desktop PC. It's running a Ryzen 5 2600 with 64 gigs of RAM uh, with Fedora 33. The good news is it doesn't have to be ginormous. So you can get by um, and and. And the demo that Andrew's going to do is a, a fully featured uh, cluster. Um, and, and there have been inroads to, to kind of reduce the footprint over time. Probably another thing to think about is storage. And if you can, um, what is that term? It's not sparse provisioning, but it's... Um, thin provision. Thank you. Thin provisioning so that you don't bump into errors with uh, KVM or, or QMU complaining about your storage going beyond what you have locally. Um, Vadim in, in chat also recommended that you at least have an SSD. Uh, Andrew and I have been in many conversations where uh, the etcd instances inside OKD just expect a certain amount of um, response time. 
uh, low latency, a, a certain amount of IOPS. They just expect that from the disks. So don't don't try this with old spinning rust. Um, those are just some some basics for how to get this up and running. What what kind of box you need. Yeah, I would definitely recommend at a minimum an SSD, and if you if you have available an NVMe disk. Um, I, I a week and a half ago, um, so not this past week, uh, but the 10th, I believe it was March 10th. Uh, I, I spent my live stream hour just talking about etcd, um, etcd with the product manager, and I have you know worked with the support team, I've worked with the engineering team, and all of that other stuff, and. Really, you want low latency storage for for etcd, and the lower the latency, the better, and the happier it will be. Um, for a lab, which is more or less what we'll be deploying today, um, you know everything is going to be in one box that will be deployed with libverts. Um, you'll see I'll be using Virtual Machine Manager for some parts. I'll be using the CLI for some parts. Um, but if you can probably get away with less, especially because you're not going to be scaling, right? You know, there's no, um, at least for for what I'm doing today. You wouldn't necessarily want to use it for production. You wouldn't want to deploy, you know, massive applications that are scaling to hundreds of pods on there. But uh, definitely take into account storage and, and storage latency when you're if you're doing any sort of production type of deployment. Okay, uh, we're about thirty minutes in, or twenty-five, because we we were dealing with that. So I think uh, it's time to let uh, Andrew. Uh, show us the the remarkable demo that you all have waited for. Ready, Andrew? I am. So hopefully you're able to see my window here. Um, so I'm I actually run a uh, a Mac desktop, but I have a VNC session into my my other desktop there. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to do here was grab this link here. I'm going to paste this into the chat. Uh, so all the stuff that I've been working on and that I'll be showing here, I'll more or less going to be, I, I documented and I shoved it into this gist. Um, so if you want to like see the exact steps that I took and all that, because I am going to skip over some things, um, like my helper node is already set up. Um, so if you wanted to see how I did that, um, it's all inside of that gist. So now I need to, so I don't distract myself by seeing myself uh, moving the mouse around, I'm gonna hide one of these windows. All right, so let's start with, well, let's start at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna use this as a bit of a reference and kind of walk through the different parts. Um, so I'll start here by saying that you'll note that I'm going to be deploying uh, more or less a five node OKD cluster. So three control plane nodes, um, you can see I, I've worked up the name there, but that's okay. We will temporarily need a uh, bootstrap machine and then I have the helper machine. So as Justin mentioned, the helper is what is providing to us several different services. Um, so today that's going to be a web server because it's going to be serving the ignition config files uh, that we'll be needing, uh, as well as the root FS uh, image that it will need to install uh, Fedora CoreOS. It will also be providing load balancer, so just a simple HA proxy config. Uh, and then let's see, what else does it do? Uh, DNS. And that's that's really it. And as Justin said, right, we can use libvirt for some of that. Uh, so let me bring up Virtual Machine Manager here. So I've got another a number of other machines. Um, so these are just laptops and other stuff that are sometimes powered on that I sometimes use in my lab. Now, if we look at the details for this machine, however, all I did was create a new virtual network. Um, so if we click down here on the plus, uh, so give it a name, whatever we want to call it. Uh, I am going to NAT it and then pick a subnet that we want to use for it. Um, I used uh, 192.168.110.0 slash 24. And then we don't need DHCP because uh, we're going to be using static IPs in this particular configuration. So if we were to click the finish there, uh, what we would end up with is this network here. You can see it's very straightforward. Now, Libvirt does use effectively behind the scenes DNS mask as well. Uh, and you can go in and you can create, um, essentially, I don't remember which section it is. Uh, you, you can assign it to give out uh, static DHCP leases. You can assign it to do DNS resolution for all of those nodes and all that other stuff inside of there. Um, I didn't do that today just because, you know, I, I wanted to show the helper node. Um, so pretty straightforward there. The only other thing that I did, uh, where'd it go? 
The only other thing that I did here, I created a separate storage domain. You can see var lib libvert okd images. Uh, this is actually mounted as a, uh, it, it is a NVMe device. So I just have a second NVMe device in, uh, in the box. And then I mounted that into this location with, uh, I think this one's running ext4 um, instead of XFS because Fedora seems to be shying away from XFS for some reason. Uh, but yeah, pretty straightforward. So I need a network. I might need storage if I need to dedicate something, if I don't have enough space or if my uh, default drive or my, my boot drive doesn't have the performance that I need, which I did here. But otherwise, pretty standard libvert. Go ahead, Justin. I was going to ask folks uh, if they have some input while Andrew shows us this of what they were targeting. Uh, we'd be interested to hear, you know, are you targeting an install on Ubuntu or, or is it for your home lab or is it for a dev? We just were, we were talking about this before in prepping. Uh, we'd, we'd like to hear your feedback as we go through this about um, what you're thinking. John says general OKD knowledge, which is also great. That's all. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll trust you to keep an eye on the chat because I can't really see the whole part of the window. Um, so the other thing to be aware of here is, so I'm using Fedora 33, and Fedora 33 uh, is one of the operating systems that is now using systemd resolve D as the default resolver. So the result of that is basically I want to be able to have my box, right, my workstation here, resolve over to the machines that we're going to be deploying with OKD inside them. So I already know that I'm going to call my that internal LAN, that, that temporary one that I'm using for my OKD deployments, OKD.LAN. So effectively, now that I created, so remember over here, I created my new network. So I have my virtual network OKD. So if I were to do like a, an MCLI con show, Probably ought to do it with a sudo. Uh, oh, I'm on the wrong node. That's why. Uh, so I have this virtual bridge one, and I can do an IPA and show that virtual bridge one here is my 110 network. So essentially, I need to tell systemd resolve d that, hey, when you see an okd.lan uh, domain name, I want you to send those DNS queries to this location. And same thing with reverse DNS and all of that. So that's what this set of commands here is going to do. So I'm literally going to copy and paste those and have them execute. And then we can do a solve. Sorry, I can't talk and type at the same time. So we can see here that whenever it sees those domains, it is going to send them across that virtual bridge one interface. We can do the same thing with DNS. You see it's saying anytime I need to resolve something on that interface, I'm going to point it to this host. And that host is actually incorrect. That host should be 39, which is the IP address of my helper node virtual machine. So we can check that and we can see that we're good to go there. So now anytime I do an NS lookup, so let's do a NS lookup of api.cluster.okd.lan, it will, well, theoretically, it will resolve over there. And I'll have to see why that's, it could be that my uh, DNS service isn't running over here in the helper. So we'll take a look at that now. So here I'm connected to the helper. Um, so this particular interface, I guess I should have changed the colors on these so that way they're easier to see. Uh, so this particular one is in, uh, so Beret is the name of my Fedora machine. Uh, helper is the name of my helper machine. And if I do check the status, we can see that, yep, DNS mask is currently failing on there. So I'll have to figure out why that is. It says it doesn't like the interface name, how strange. Um, so my helper node here, and if we follow over here in the gist, uh, you can see step two is create and configure the helper node. So I am using Podman for the HTTP server, HTTPD server, uh, and then I just installed regular HA proxy and DNS mask. You can deploy those into pods. Uh, it's a little more, I tried to run these as non-root containers and that's a little more involved. Um, so 
instead, I just went ahead and did a DNF uh, install of those two services. Um, Justin mentioned before Christian uh, Hernandez created the helper node. Uh, so if you go to the helper node, um, let me dig up that link real quick. I'll, I'll share it in the chat. Okay, so if you change the uh, tag on that, if there is a helper node v2 beta, and that whole thing is containerized. Uh, so Christian has gone through and he took it from being, you know, services that are deployed as normal services to a system. Uh, they're all now in pods and they can all now be used uh, that way. And even has a helper node control type of thing going on in there. All right, so let's come back over here. So I'll check on DNS mask first. So I have this okd.conf for uh, DNS mask. So for whatever reason, it's not liking this particular uh, uh, item. I'll have to take a look at that here in just a moment. Uh, essentially what we're doing here is these three are prerequisites for OKD. So it needs to be able to resolve to the API and API internal load balanced endpoints. And we can see that those are pointing at this host at the helper node, which is running HA proxy. And we'll look at the HA proxies config in just a moment. And then we need a wild card for apps. So if I do at, you know, test.apps.cluster.okd.land, that should resolve, same as over here, to the, the helper node, which has that load balancer going on. The other thing that we need is our node entries. So I said before that we're doing static IP addresses. So I went ahead and added those IP address and, and name resolutions into the DNS mask config. And that's really all we've got. Um, so let me double check why this is not in P1S0. I don't know why that isn't working. Hey, Diane, I, I saw that you joined. Welcome. Um, do you know in Hopman, is there a way to make Andrew's um, screen share bigger as an attendee or a viewer? It really um, doesn't because it got, it has our faces down below. So they're seeing it at 75%. So if you can make your font bigger in the black, um, that would probably make people like me with my glasses on my top of my head as opposed to on my nose, um, happier. Um, <laughs> I figured you might say that. Yeah, I know. It's me. Well, plus I wanted to clearly see what, um, as we look at this DNS, try to see what was, uh, what it was saying. By the way, Andrew, you will get a chuckle out of a comment that John said, John said, system D resolve D was a PIDA. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. Um, it, the, the ranting that I was doing on my team's uh, Slack channel the other day about having to figure out how it was working and why, and it took me, I, no lie, probably two hours of searching the internet and testing things to finally figure out those three silly commands. Um, and you know, the, the Fedora team did a great job when they first announced Fedora 33 about, you know, Hey, you can, uh, you know, we have this new thing and it's great for split, split DNS when you're connected to VPNs and all this other stuff, but there's nothing about how to configure it. Um, so yeah, I, I feel your frustration. Um, and I cannot, I think it's because I'm in, yeah, I, I'm, I'm in a, oh, there we go. There it is. I can see control control shift from plus from inside of a VNC session. Yeah. Works All right. Every time. So hopefully that's easier to see. So it I did, is. Okay, good. Uh, so I did get DNS mask working. I don't know why it didn't start by default. You, if you were paying attention there, I just did a simple, you know, sys control starts DNS mask. And if we do the same thing here, uh, you know, I did that NS lookup and it goes right over and it resolves my test. So I can also do a test.apps.cluster.okd.lan and it resolves right over to our helper node. So a couple of things to note here. Uh, so you saw when I first set up everything, I'm using this okd.lan subnet or a, a domain name rather. 
So cluster is actually going to be my extremely creative, right? Because you know I'm I'm a TME, not a not a designer. Uh, extremely creative cluster name. So this will be unique to each OKD deployment that you have. And then after that, we have these different names for the different functions inside of there, with apps being a wildcard. So I can literally put in anything inside of here, and it will always resolve over to that load balancer that it's pointed at. So that covers DNS. Uh, the next one that we want to talk about is, or DNS through DH, uh, DNS mask. Next one that we want to talk about is HA proxy. So if you're looking at that gist that I posted inside of there, you'll see the full contents of this file. Uh, other things that I don't like about Fedora 33, they replaced Vim with Nano as the default uh, editor, which throws me through a loop. For shame, for shame. Uh, so coming down to the HA proxy uh, uh, config here, there's a couple of things to pay attention to. I do turn on stats. Um, and that's just a convenience thing, especially in a lab, especially if you're testing. It's nice to be able to see when the API servers, when the endpoints pop in and out. So after that, we start getting into the actual load balanced endpoints. So the first one is the API server. So this is what domain name points at. You can see it's 6443. And then on the back end, we're passing it to our bootstrap because the bootstrap comes up first, and then our three control plane nodes. Being HA proxy, I don't need to modify the configuration of this as this bootstrap node goes up and down and as I reload the clusters, because it'll automatically say, hey, you're not responding, right? The, the check here, you're not responding, I'm not gonna send traffic over there. So moving down, we have the front end and back end for the machine config server. Same as above, that points to the bootstrap and the control planes. Um, so one interesting thing to note here, right? The machine config server is how the machine config operator serves up the configuration, the machine config, to the nodes. So this is an unauthenticated endpoint. Right? Basically, you can go in, you can pull that HTTP traffic or, or HTTPS traffic, but it is not authenticated, and be able to see that machine config. Uh, so this one is, um, this is effectively the API int, API internal endpoint. So if you are separating your traffic, if you want to have kind of maximum security protection, Again, this is a lab, I'm not concerned about it. Um, you would want to have this as either limited to just being the other nodes in the cluster or even possibly on an internal only network um, that's available there. So moving on down here, we then have our ingress endpoints. So this, these two are going to be the API, or excuse me, the uh, star.apps wildcard. So we have one for HTTP and one for HTTPS. And notice that, it's not in here because I set it up at the top. I apologize, I'm gonna page up, so it's gonna jump around on you. Uh, see my default mode here is TCP. So it's doing mo uh, layer four, or, yeah, layer four load balancing. Uh, so it's just passing through things like all of the SSL encryption, all of that directly to the routers that are running inside of OKD. So that way it can do retermination and all that other stuff itself. Um, you can do layer seven. Uh, I have not done it, but I've been told multiple times that it is possible, so. And just to check on that, we'll go ahead and go to helper.okd.lan and we'll go to port 9000. Yes, I know. The HA proxy stats page? Yep. That's assuming that I put in a uh, DNS entry for the helper, which I don't think I did. Yeah, it's not up here. So Will it, we'll, hmm. we'll go by IP. Yeah. It should resolve, but I didn't put the uh, that that name in there. And here's our HA proxy stats page. So you can see there's no nodes that are up um, at the moment. And then, um, so we took care of DNS via DNS mask. We did HA proxy. You can see here as we scroll through this gist, let me make this a little bit bigger for you all as well. Um, the last thing is an HTTP server. So if we do a ps-a, well, uh, did I create it as root? 
there goes my thing about creating, I guess I did, creating non-root containers. Um, make a liar out of me. Uh, well, they used to require, like Docker used to require some root. So was that just like an old leftover yeah. habit so, you had? So Docker does, and I, what I probably did, I was uh, I had su'd over sudo dash i over to root because I was probably modifying some config and wasn't paying attention who I was logged in as and uh, created this pod. Um, anyways, it, it it works um, super easy. I'm just redirecting port eighty eighty um, externally to port eighty on the pod, uh, so that's important because remember port eighty is being load balanced for the cluster that we're using. So that's why we're using port eighty eighty for the HTTP server. Um, aside from that, uh, I had gone in and inside of my web docs and I just linked um, here we'll bring up oops bring up that page again so you see I attached a volume of our www html to the pods uh, HD docs or HD root and inside of here you see I've got two different directories I'll do a quick tree in here so the first one is ignition. We'll use that in just a moment. This is where we'll dump the ignition files that our nodes are going to need when we install them. The other one is this install directory. Uh, so these are the three metal uh, uh, files that we need for our deployment. So why is that? And, and what do I mean by that? So with libvirt, there is no UPI, there is no IPI type of integration. Right. So that means that we have to do what Red Hat and what OpenShift calls a platform agnostic non-integrated deployment. So essentially this is going to be the same type of deployment that you would do to a physical server, even though it's VMs. And it means that there's no integration, no cloud provider integration, no CSI or entry storage provision integration with the underlying infrastructure. Now, if you're deploying to Overt or something like that, there is that integration. Right. You can deploy an installer provisioned infrastructure, um, IPI cluster, and it will connect to your, your Overt manager. It'll talk through the APIs to provision the VMs. It'll configure the CSI provisioner. Right? It'll do all that stuff out of the box. Um, but that's not what we're doing here because this is libvirt and we don't have that integration. Except when we do, and I'll talk about that in just a moment too. So. I'm jumping ahead here by showing you this, but a little bit further down, and I'll revisit this in a moment, a little bit further down, uh, I'll show the links to download those. I just do a quick wget and then move them over there and make sure that the permissions are correct. Uh, so that way they can be retrieved by the nodes when we need them, uh, which is oh, the next step. There we go. So from my libvirt host, so that means that I'm on this beret uh, host. You can see I'm in the OKD directory. Uh, we want to pull down a couple of different things. So the first thing that we want to pay attention to here is notice that I'm using a slightly older version of OKD. Uh, as Justin was alluding to earlier, uh, I tried doing it with the very latest bits, with the latest 4.7 bits, and uh, was having issues with the bootstrap. Uh, so if you happen to be on uh, the GitHub page, if you're looking through the issues, you'll see there's some comments for me regarding that. So um, I'm using 4.6, I'm using from back in mid-February here, because that's the one that I was able to get to work. Uh, we need to pull down two files. Um, so we need the OpenShift install, and we need the OpenShift client. So when we pull those two down, pretty straightforward. Uh, all we're going to do is unpack them, and then move the three files that are within, OpenShift-install, OC, and kubectl, into user local bin. You don't have to put them in the path. I just find it easiest to do that. So if we come back over here, and we do an OpenShift install version, what we should see is OpenShift install version 4.6, 2021.02.14. Uh, same thing for our OC, 4.6. So I've got my CLI tools in place now. If we switch back over to here, now I need to move over to our helper node and download those three binaries that I was just showing you. So we, so we have our root FS, our netram fs and our kernel image. So download those. Here's where we create those directories. Download those, put them in the right place, make sure that the permissions are set correctly, and now we can access that. And just to make sure, we'll browse. Oh, not HTTPS. <laughs> Why 
are you? Um, if you if you Go do a, a, a just a basic curl from the oh no, you know what it is. My pod isn't running. Oh, yeah. So that's up. So why aren't you serving me any files? Well, I knew that Sometimes. I would I would anger the demo gods at some point. So. <laughs> Sometimes uh, I don't know about the the containerized HDBD, but sometimes the permissions. What you're well is that pod running as root and it has permissions to all those files, right? Yeah, it should. But let's check. Um, yeah, I, I agree with John. That usually, when this happens, it's some kind of weird permission issue. Well, theoretically, we have access to all those. Who's that? Uh, are you inside the pod now? I, I can't see it's the, the hop in thing is obscuring. No, so I just did a, a Podman logs against the pod just to see what the logs okay. are saying. The logs seem to think that it's fine. Um, how very strange. 110.39. Maybe... Well, just, just to appease the previous error where all you did was restart DNS mask, maybe just restart that pod? Uh, I did that. Oh. Well, it... well, no, always a always a difficult one. Something's always got to auto break or got to break. Um, that's okay. We can work around that uh, because I happen to have a separate uh, web server available, and we'll just point to that. Um, so I'll use. Uh, see, see. Um... Sorry, Seal, I probably am mispronouncing your name. I, I cannot pronounce your name. Um, uh, is, is Firewall D running on this box? Nope. I you try would think to, it would just, wait, just when be I, a non-response. Yeah, when I do demos, I try and turn all, everything off that can interfere, um, even though, yes, it's horrible, terrible practice, and you should never actually do that for demos. I try to make it as easy on myself as possible. Um, so what I'll do instead is I will use my other web server. Um, and it'll just require changing a couple of things later on. See, to make it easier on myself, I also reuse IPs, just different subnets. <laughs> that does make it much easier. While you do that, um, I think it, it's good to rehash something, Andrew. You probably were about to get to this, so I'll jump the gun and just mention it. Um, wait a minute. John says in chat, 503 means HA proxy isn't seeing the server. Is that oh web server behind the proxy? Yeah, you know what I'm doing? Here. Thank you, John. You are absolutely correct. Because that is not going through HA proxy. There. <laughs> oh. Perfect. Well, that's not embarrassing at all. Um, yes, you were no, actually it, correct, it, John, it, it, of port 80 is HA proxy that is going to the cluster that we're going to deploy. Uh, port 8080 is the web server that we want to use here. So thank you. I, I appreciate your help there, John. Live troubleshooting. That's awesome.
I know. Um, never a dull moment. All right. Uh, so our web server is up. Uh, we're good there. I have pulled all of our install files. If I go here to the install, we see we have our three files. Um, so from our libvirt host, now we need to, and let me, let me get out of here. Here's here. Uh, I want to wrap up my previous thought because I think this is still a good point to mention it. You know, some folks, maybe not here because we seem pretty techy, but uh, in the recording, we'll say this is a lot of heavy lift. I got to download all these files. I got to set up all of this configuration. Isn't there an, a push button thing? Um, it sounded like you were going to hint at this. Can, yep. can we uh, mention gonna... it now? Yeah, I'll cover that in just a second. I'm gonna create this okay. uh, or walk through this install config. Uh, so the next step here, uh, I'm on step four here, create the install config. So from our libvirt host, which remember is the one that we downloaded OpenShift install to, uh, we're literally just gonna create right, the install config. So if we walk through this, it's pretty straightforward. Um, so first we wanna make sure that we have an SSH key in here so that way we can connect over to the VMs once they've been deployed. Uh, remember there's only key-based authentication with the user core. Uh, and then the pull secret is actually just a dummy secret. Um, you can see here, we're just using this uh, non-useful non, non text. So aside from that, there's a few interesting or a few important parts. Uh, so one, we wanna set the base domain to the same thing that we used on our libvirt network. Uh, the same thing that we configured in our helper node with DNS mask. So the worker replicas, we're going to set that to zero. We will have workers, so, but we still want to set this to zero. This is basically indicating that it's not responsible for provisioning any of those. We'll have three master replicas or three control plane replicas. And then down here, these will be defaults. Um, so the, the cluster network, this is what it uses to assign pod networks to each one of the nodes. So it'll take this slash 14 and it'll carve it up into 23s and assign a 23 to each one of the nodes in the cluster. And that's where those pods get assigned. The service network is the set of IPs that are used for services. So when you create a service, the IP it gets assigned comes from here. So this networking.machinenetwork.cider is very important. So we want to make sure that this value matches the subnet that we're deploying our virtual machines too. So 110.0 is what I'm using here. The reason why this is important is because OKD CoreOS looks for an interface on this subnet and that is the interface that it will configure, for example, the SDN on. Uh, it's also used, for example, if you're using a proxy, it will automatically add this subnet to the no proxy and in a few different other places. So a lot of times we'll see people that they forget to set this or they don't set it at all and there's just random failures or occasional things that go wrong and it's hard to figure out why. So, um, so and the reason why I said I'll get to the, uh, the, the faster version of that is because regardless of whether we're doing this kind of non-integrated, what used to be called bare metal UPI or an IPI type version, we always wanna create an install config. So let's look at what that looks like. So if I do an open shift install, create ignition config, oops, not ignition config, install config. Right, so using IPI, I can use the interactive installer and I can step through each one of these things that's happening here. And I can choose the one that I want to use or the infrastructure that I want to deploy to. And actually I need to pull the most recent version of the CLI tool. So let me do that real quick. Because if you look at, uh, so, if you look at the 4.7 uh, installer, and I want to go to here, and I want to go to here. So if we look at the installer for 4.7, if we do an IPI, it actually lists libvirt as one of the options. So we'll pull down this real quick. You see when I untar that, I get my OpenShift install. So if we do an OpenShift install, create ignition config. With 
what I'm going to get is this libvert option. And it will ask me to connect to, right, which libvert do I want to connect to? So this happens to be the local host. Um, if we browse to, and I will share this link in just a moment. Uh, if we browse to GitHub slash OpenShift slash installer, and we go to docs, dev, libvert. Let me take this guy and paste it here. Uh, so this is effectively the the kind of how to set up and how to use this IPI, libvert API side of things. Uh, so the important thing here, and I've done this with my host that I'm working with, uh, we'll skip past all this, configure libvert to accept TCP connections. So effectively what we're doing is telling libvert to accept an unauthenticated connection across TCP. And that's how it connects. So if I copy this string here, and we'll copy that, and if I go to Virtual Machine Manager and do a add connection, I can do a custom URL, paste that in, and you notice it didn't, authentic it didn't ask for any kind of authentication. Right, it's the, these two are the same host. So if I were to go here and disconnect this one and then connect it again, it prompts me for authentication. So this one is unauthenticated. That is what the installer, that is how it communicates with our host to be able to uh, create and connect those virtual machines. Um, so you do need to configure that before using it. Uh, as we come down through here, it kind of walks through all those different things. Eventually we get down here to setting up network manager DNS overlay. Uh, so this is one of the same thing that we were talking about with Fedora 33 and systemd resolvedy. This is the same thing if you're using other operating systems that use network manager with the DNS overlay. So this is how you tell network manager to configure your uh, resolver to point to that local network inside of there. And note that it does deliberately do this 126. Dot one, so make sure that you do that IP address. So let's walk through this process. Um, so liver connection URI is the local one, right? Base domain, we'll call it uh, okd.lan again. My cluster name is cluster two. And the pull secret is that same empty pull secret that we had from before. I should really store this somewhere other than right here. And what it's gonna do, is it will go through, and I should have turned on the debug logging, but behind the scenes, it's creating the resources that it needs. Oh, I forgot I created the uh, ignition config. And if we look at our, so here's our ignitions and all of that. I meant to create uh, uh, install config, not ignition config. And if I do a simple create cluster now, So it's gonna pull down the Terraform provider. It's gonna do everything that it needs to get started. And if I check over here, you can see that it's automatically created a new network, right? And this is where it's using, you know, the internal, essentially a round robin DNS load balancer, quote unquote, to resolve all those things. Uh, here in a moment, it'll start up a virtual machine, do all of that other stuff. It also created a new storage uh, uh, pool. So we have this cluster one, you can see it's underneath OpenShift images in this instance. And it's going through and do, doing its thing. The problem is this doesn't work. Um, so there's, there's an error, there's a bug in the current one where uh, here in a moment it'll finish and it will create two virtual machines that'll create a bootstrap and it will create a control plane node. And the bootstrap only has four gigs of RAM, which is not enough. Uh, so. It turns on um, when the, the OKD bootstrap process goes through, it pulls down a new uh, image and then uses RPM mastery to switch to that image. And that image is larger than the temporary swap space, the, the slash var run or slash run rather space that is available. So it runs out of space and it never succeeds. You can get it to go further uh, if you, and I think I almost had one running earlier today, if you catch it before it boots, so basically if you immediately turn off those virtual machines, uh, edit both of them to give them uh, at least 16 gigabytes of RAM and then turn them back on uh, and then wait long enough, you should be able to get a cluster at that point. Uh, and it will do, it will be IPI 
um, I would recommend again doing the uh, creating an ignition config, or excuse me, an install config, not ignition configs, install config, and setting it to have more than just the default one control plane, one worker node. Um, but so, so let's pa pause for a moment just to to recap because uh, that that was a, a lot to digest. So there's two methods. Uh, the method that you just are showing us now and showing everyone now is the automated integrated quote unquote IPI uh, method against libvirt where the installer, the OKD installer is calling libvirt, making all those calls, creating the VMs. It already downloaded everything it needed. Oh, there it is. Yep, the VMs. So the previous method that you had started to take us down was the non-integrated non-automated um, where you basically have to download all the images and uh, set up all the configuration etc so just to be just to restate that these were two different install methods and the reason to not use the automated one is it's brand new as of 4.7 and there is that memory bug that you were mentioning correct yeah and and the goal is and i'm sure that we'll get there before long um, the the goal is Right, sure, it would be great to have IPI, and especially if we can do a single node IPI on something like this, where you just say, you know, open shift install create cluster, and it points to that local libvirt, it deploys a virtual machine, it gets everything up and running all inside of that single node, that would be great. Um, I would love for that to happen. Um, and I, I actually, I intend to continue uh, uh, seeing if I can get that to work on my node even after this particular event, so. John has a question for you in chat, Andrew. Yeah, so I said, so can I, can you set the memory in the install config? Uh, so unfortunately, no. Um, and the reason why that is is because it's not actually defined as an option inside of there. So if I do uh, OpenShift install explain install config dot, and we can just step through this, right? So we see we have our platform here. So if I do install config dot platform, and then we have libvirt. So we have the URI to connect to the, def the default machine platform, which is, I honestly don't know what that is, but it's as an object, it is um, empty. So I haven't figured that one out yet. You can see it's just a resource object. And if we switch to, for example, control plane, So install config dot control plane, and then we go to platform, same as before. If you're familiar with the install process, this is usually where you would set the uh, set those values. Libvirt, see, we don't have any options in install config to set them. So for the worker nodes, you could do it by so creating the install config and then doing a generate manifest and then going into the manifest and modifying the machine set that it creates to put the right amount of memory. Um, but the control plane nodes are created by the installer and the installer has no, right, we, we just walk through that tree. There's no parameters in there for adjusting it. Um, so yeah, we have seen hidden parameters. I My cursory searching through the uh, GitHub repo did not turn up any of those. Um, so it, it might be worth asking, you know, on GitHub or something like that. Uh, if anybody knows of any, but th this has been my cheat so far is to just power it off immediately and then adjust it um, and test it out. So for better or for worse, that's that's where we are right now. I'm gonna do an RM, oh no, I want to go into that directory. Yeah, John, I think, uh, John, you, you were making some comments about vSphere. You can set the uh, sizing, I think. With, with yeah. most of the other platforms, you can. Um, I was about to say Overt has that too. You yeah. Can set that. Yeah, the the Libvirt API feels a little neglected sometimes, um, so it's it's not there. But definitely with uh, Overt slash Rev, definitely with vSphere, definitely with OpenStack, um, as well as I believe the hyperscalers, you can change all of those things. So with the hyperscalers like AWS, you would change the instance type that it's using. But um, okay. So I just I just destroyed those resources. Um, so that is one of the nice things. It does clean up after itself. So if we come back here and we see our network is gone and that extra storage pool is gone. All right, so back to um, our regularly scheduled. So I have an install config. 
that I created. Very straightforward. It is using the okd.lan, and I'll do a cat on this guy just so we can look at it as I talk. Um, oh, I say that, and look, I have it set up for my other um, my other one, so I should go ahead and modify these. So we're going to use our okd.lan uh, domain name. Coming down through here, we need to make sure that our machine cider is set correctly. So this is 110. Uh, and then everything else we can pretty much leave at the default. Again, definitely make sure that you have your, your public key for SSH inside of here so you can connect over to the nodes. Um, oh, and the last thing that we wanna do here is set the name correctly. So the, the domain name that you need will be a combination of this name value plus base domain. So cluster.okd.lan, uh, which remember is what I set in D, uh, DNS mask. So with our install config, I'm now going to copy that into this cluster folder. And it's just an empty folder. I just created it as a holding spot. The reason why I always do this is because when you do the next step, it quote unquote ingests the install config.yaml and deletes it. So if you want to go through multiple iterations without having to constantly recreate that file by hand, I always put it someplace and then copy it into. So we'll put that guy inside of there. And then the next step that we want to do, so, all right, so at this point we have created our install config, we've staged it in, in a, our folder, right? Remember we already have the, uh, the bits that we need for like the kernel, for the init RAMFS, all that other stuff staged on our web server. So now we need to generate manifests. And we're going to point it at the cluster or the cluster folder that we just put our install config into. If I didn't have this, it would simply con consume the one that's in the directory. One thing to be aware of, sometimes we'll see folks that have, you know, they, they try and do an OpenShift install and it keeps causing like really weird errors. Um, look for hidden files in the directory that are like OpenShift install logs and stuff like that. Uh, because the install app, the, the binary will look at those files and it'll make decisions for you. And you're like, but it didn't ask me that, or why did it do this? I didn't tell it to do that. So make sure you in, you remove all of those files that are inside of there. And I'll show you what those look like in just a minute. So there we see, it, it consumes the install config from the target directory. So if we go into our cluster directory here and do an LSLA, see these two files? Those are files that it uses to make decisions for you, right? So more or less pick up where an install left off or something like that. So this is why I always recommend, you know, create a, a subfolder, copy your install config into there and then do everything inside of there. When you're done with it, just rm rf that whole folder so you can clear it out and start completely fresh each time. Or uh, what I do is I create a new folder each time and switch over to it. Yeah. Is that, okay. So real quickly, I'm going to set our masters to not be schedulable. So why do I have to do this? Remember in the install config, we set the number of replicas for the control plane to be three and the number of replicas for the worker nodes to be zero. The installer assumes if there's zero worker nodes that the control plane needs to be schedulable. We don't want that in this case. Uh, so I am telling it through the manifest file, make the masters non-schedulable. Schedulable. It's a hard word to say. So, and this is a part of the regular install documentation. I should have linked to that from that gist. Maybe I'll update it. Um, you know, all, all of the install docs are linked off of uh, docs.okd.io and you can go in and look at, um, here, I'll bring that up real quick. I put it in the chat earlier. Okay. Um, but I do want to take the time. This is actually a good time to ask you, Andrew. Um, sometimes it gets a little confusing which of the steps to execute for the installer. So you showed us generate the install config, generate the initial config, generate the manifest. And sometimes it's not clear when to do which, like the manifest yeah. you just showed us, are, are you edit those, for example, when you need to change a, a master to be schedulable? Are there kind of like general recommendations do you usually always generate the install config yes like you, yeah you so that, that's a really good point and it's something that you know even the openshift documentation does a terrible job of pointing out so if you're doing ipi 
with a hyperscaler, so AWS, Azure, Google, et cetera, then you can I, I absolutely go in and do an OpenShift uh, install, create cluster, and just go. You don't have to worry about anything. If you're doing an on-prem IPI deployment, I always recommend doing a create uh, uh, install config first, answer all the questions. So on-prem IPI, OpenShift install, create install config. It'll ask you all the questions. Um, so what do you want to install to? I want to install to uh, overt. Okay, what's your overt manager endpoint? What's your overt manager credentials? Uh, which cluster do you want to use? Which network do you want to use? Which storage domain do you want to use? So on and so forth. And it'll spit out that uh, install config at the end. Then you want to modify that install config to make sure that that networking.machinenetwork.cider is correct. Because by default, it'll be I think it's 10.0.0.0 slash eight or something like that. So if that's not right for your you know, uh, environment, you absolutely need to change that because otherwise it can lead to those random problems down the road. Now, if you want to do a compact cluster, so three nodes with schedulable control plane, at that point, you can go ahead and do OpenShift install create cluster. It'll read that in that install config and it'll begin the deployment process. If you want to have, uh, if you want to do a, uh, if you want to, let's see, if, if you want to modify things like the machine sets, so change the amount of CPU or RAM or something like that, and you forgot to do it in the install config, um, all of those things, you can generate the manifests, and then the manifests, you can go in and modify things. So one of the things that we showed is, using the manifest to automatically create an infra machine set. So that way it'll deploy infra nodes, doesn't add the workload to them, but at least deploys the infra nodes kind of right away or right from the start. Now, if you're doing on-prem UPI, I tend to recommend always doing, well, it, it varies, but almost always I end up doing, um, I create the install config by hand. Um, sometimes I'll do a, uh, kick it off with the OpenShift install create uh, install config. I keep wanting to say ignition configs, which is wrong. Um, install config, it gives me that template and then I can go in and, and edit it by hand to so remove the platform section, for example. Um, so create the ignition config or install config rather. Create manifests specifically because we want to mark the schedule of the masters as non-schedulable, unless you want that three node compact deployment. Um, I very rarely do that just because I, I almost always have other, it, my, my default config is a lot of times to test Kubert and stuff like that. So I want to have dedicated physical uh, uh, nodes. So that's why like I have all of those other random laptops, old laptops and stuff like that. I turn those into OKD nodes for Kubert. Um, <laughs> and then um, Good. from there, you know, going on with the rest of the process. So yeah, we, we don't make it easy in the documentation for when to use each one and why to use each one. Uh, it's still much clearer than how it's usually documented. Thank you. So, um, okay, so all I did here was I created or I, I marked our control plane nodes as non-schedulable. And then I'm going to do an OpenShift install create ignition configs, the one that I want this time. And we'll specify that it's in the same subdirectory that we did before. So at this point, it will consume all of these files that we saw inside of here, and it will generate the ignition configs. Uh, so one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the ignition configs, and specifically the bootstrap ignition config, is more or less all of these files, base64 encoded and laid out to be put into the right places, throughout that bootstraps um, setup. So if you were to go in and you know, if I look at my cluster, see I have this bootstrap, see how it's 283 kilobytes. Uh, so if we were to look at that, it would have all of those files base64 encoded in there along with the uh, certificates and all the other things that are inside of there. So, okay, so let's switch back over to, oops, let's switch back over to our gist that I was using. So here's our ignition config that or I keep saying ignition config, install config. Sorry, install config. Uh, here's what we just did, right? We created our cluster, we copied our install config inside of there, we created the manifests, 
we set our control plane to be non-schedulable, we generated the ignition configs. So now I need to put those ignition configs onto our helper node, onto the web server. Uh, and this is so that when our nodes boot up, right, they're able to reach out, they pull down that ignition config, so that way they can do that initial configuration. Uh, so we're getting better with the various IPI installs of being able to attach those without having to host them on a web server. Uh, but with the non-integrated method, we do still have to do that. Uh, so for example, uh, if you were to do a VMware deployment, right, with VMware, you can go in and you can set a VM property that will attach all of that data inside of there. So we'll copy this command and paste it inside of here. You can see I'm just copying all of those ignition files over to our helper node into the right place. But we need to do it as the correct user, not as that user. And if we switch back over here, so this is our helper node web server, and we check ignition, we see we have our ignition files, and I need to set the permissions correctly. I do note that on the, uh, over here, made you to adjust the permissions, so I'll do that real quick. So we'll set those to... This time it was a permission issue. Yeah. So we'll do that real quick, and now we're offered to download our bootstrap file. Okay, so we're good to go there. So now we are on to step six. Uh, and this is where it gets interesting with libverts. Um, I had a, a lot of fun uh, automating this and playing with uh, uh, some new things that I didn't know about libvert uh, yesterday and, and yesterday evening. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is create the disks that we need for our virtual machines. Uh, so I am not on the helper node. I am on my libvert node. And I'm going to paste that command in. All we're doing here is a simple loop where for each one of the nodes, we do a QMU image create of a 120 gigabytes QCOW2 image inside of our, remember my mounted storage pool. All right, so now we have all of those files inside of there. If I, just for giggles, want to go over here and look in the storage and do a refresh. See, we now have all of these QCOWs inside of there. Uh, so 120 gigs is usually my default size for these. Um, it's, it, I would say it's the minimum size that you would want for any kind of production cluster, any kind of long running cluster. Uh, remember that this space, this 120 gigabytes will be used for everything Fedora CoreOS is doing, as well as any container images that are downloaded, as well as any scratch space, as well as any empty dirs, uh, logs that are generated, right? All of those things go inside of there. And effectively, if that fills up, it's, um, it's a bad day, right? It means that you got, got a lot of work to do to recover. Uh, so the next step after that, uh, so we'll set those permissions correctly because now they're on my root and we want them to be owned by the QMU user. So I'm going to create a working directory for our virtual machine definitions. I've already done this step. Um, so this is pulling from our web server, those kernel and init RAM FS images um, or, or files. You can see I'm just pulling them down. I'm putting them into varlib libvert boot. So if I look inside of that directory, I really miss being able to do a keyboard copy and paste, but BNC doesn't let me do that. Uh, we have our files inside of here. Um, they're available to us. Now, the reason why I want them locally on this box is because in the next step, we're going to tell it to do a local kernel boot of our virtual machine to do the install. So we're gonna use a couple of variables and, here. Go ahead. And just a second reason that I, in my brief uh, headaches with libvert, um, that var lib libvert has certain permissions. I don't even remember if it's just standard, it might be extended attribute permissions that if you, don't put things there, um, whatever isn't there, or if you try to use a different directory, libvert will start to complain. A VM might not, it might boot once and then not, might, I've seen it not be able to reboot after a while. So um, that that's a special directory for sure for, for 
things like storing images for libvert. Yeah, it's I've had the same thing, and permissions are always an issue. It seems like. Um, yep. So my three variables here, right? Kernel is pointing to the file that we just described up here. Same thing with init rd. Kernel args is important. So remember, I said that we needed to point it to where the root fs is at, and it's hosted off of our helper web server. We're telling it that it does need networking to continue. And we're going to tell it which disk it's going to install CoreOS to. So in this instance, we'll be creating a disk using the vert.io controller. So it'll be dev VDA. If you use SCSI or SATA, make sure that's set to SDA. So this is where things start to get interesting. So I'm doing static IP assignments instead of DHCP. And what that means is that I need to pass a kernel argument string into each one of the virtual machines that tell it what its IP address is going to be. And that string looks like this. So let's break the string down. And all of this is in the documentation. Um, so if you go into that agnostic uh, out here, installing on, on any platform, all of this is described inside of there. So uh, don't, don't worry that you have to remember what, what I'm saying here. So the first thing is the IP address that we want this node to use, double colon, and then what is the gateway for this subnet? What is the net mask? What is the host name, including fully qualified domain name that we want to assign to it? The interface that we want to configure with all of this information? None, I don't remember what that one is, but it's always none. Uh, and then the DNS server that we want it to use. So because all of this information, except for these two bits, the node IP and the node name is the same, all I did was create that one string. And then you can see I'm just kind of going through and doing a set operation to replace it for each one of my VMs and storing that into another variable. So our bootstrap IP address is going to be 60 and the node name is bootstrap, right? Our worker zero is going to have the IP 65 with the name worker zero. And if I were to do an IP worker zero. We can see that it has done exactly what we wanted. Here's our IP of 65 and our host name of worker zero. So now the last variable that I need for right now is telling the node where to get its bootstrap. And we're gonna save this as a variable as well for the next step. So all I'm saying is your bootstrap ignition file, right? So coreos.ins.ignition URL is on our helper node, port 8080, um, ignition bootstrap.ign. So this is where it gets interesting in my opinion. Uh, so what I've done is used vert install to assign. So we see we have a disk here, which is our bootstrap. We just created that, remember? Uh, it, the interesting part is this install line where I am telling it to create all of, or, or to look to those files that we just configured to boot the virtual machine. So I'm gonna do this one real quick. And then I'm gonna copy and paste the rest of this just to execute it and do all of them at once so we can move on to the next step. But we're just repeating that for each one of the uh, control plane nodes and worker nodes. The one thing to note is that I did a little bit of, and, and you see, I use the term jiggery pokery up here. Uh, so I'm doing bash variables by reference. So essentially I determine what the node name is without the dash, because that throws uh, an error. And I create basically the same variable name that we created up here. And then down here where I actually want to use it, I reference it or I use it by referencing that name here with the bang in front of it. So uh, I had some fun doing research on bash last night because I had never done that method before. And you simplified it for a bunch of people because they technically could do this through the VM manager GUI. Correct, and that's what we're gonna do right now. Um, so the last thing that I wanna do here is this step. Uh, yep. So the last thing that we're gonna do is do a verse shell define of each one of our virtual machines. And then I, I don't know why, I don't know if it's a bug, I don't know if there's something going on. If I just leave it alone, it, it doesn't use the right, um, actually let me exit out of this. So if I look at this bootstrap XML definition, so even though I told it the kernel file is in var lib libvert boot, it 
it grabs this random name. I have no idea where that name comes from or why. <laughs> and so essentially all I'm doing, and here's the output of that whole big kernel line with all those variables and stuff like that. Um, so I, I don't know why it does that, but uh, this little bit of vert XML editing basically forces it to be what we want it to be. Hmm. All right, so we'll go ahead and do that. Could not find, uh-oh. Oh, I bet I forgot to do a pseudo in there somewhere, no? Is it just the, do you have to be in a specific directory? Because it's looking for those XML named. In node configs. So first it's, what's going on here? So bootstrap to find from node configs bootstrap, and then it says it can't find it. It's there. So it is there. Okay, well, well, I'll play your game. Um, let me bring up a text editor real quick. And what I'll do is edit my loop here and just remove the define from it. So instead of doing the verse shell define and then editing the XML, now I'm just doing the vert XML edit. That looks like oh. the same error. Yeah, um, because it's reading the file name, and that's why. So, forgive me for editing off screen, off uh, the uh, display, but all I'm doing is, you'll see in just a moment, adding each one of the uh, nodes to a for loop. This last little bit of the XML edit is to, to get rid of that weird kernel yep. text. Yeah. There we go. So all I did was use the, the VM names. So the issue was I'm doing an LS node configs and it spits mm -hmm. out the um, node name dot XML, which when we then do the, this down here, you see, I'm, I would, I was reusing. Oh, yep. Got you. Yeah. yeah. So there we go. Okay. So the end result is now here in Virtual Machine Manager, I have all of my VMs. So let's look at what I just did on the command line and how that looks and how you can do it in the GUI. So the first thing I'll do is open up this VM and kind of peruse through the different settings that are inside of here. Uh, so CPUs, I'm giving these four, any, the control plane and bootstrap, four CPUs, uh, 12 gigabytes of memory. Uh, that's just to make sure that it has more than enough to do the things that it needs to do. And then the magic that's happening here is underneath the boot options, I'm doing this direct kernel boot. And I'm having it boot off of that kernel and that init RAM FS image with all of those kernel args that we built to do the static IP assignments and where to install to and all that other stuff. After that, it's pretty standard, right? The disk that we created, the network adapter, we don't really care what MAC address it gave it or anything like that because we're using static IPs, not DHCP. And everything after that is, is standard. Um, the one thing to note here, we are using the Fedora CoreOS stable. So if you were to search here for just CoreOS, you'll note that there are three of them that come up. I happen to be using the stable one. So you can create these manually if you so choose, right? Click the create new VM. We'll do a manual install. Um, you could also do, I think, import existing disk image if you pre-create the disk. So we're going to do the same CoreOS here. CoreOS stable. We'll give it the amount of memory that we want it to have and CPUs. 
So I'm just going to let it default create a, a disk here. We can select, we can put it into a, an alternate pool if we choose, and then give it some sort of name. So one thing to note, we want to make sure that we put it onto the right network. And I'm going to customize the configuration before install. And then this is where I would want to go in and make sure that my boot options are set correctly. So we just click that, and then we browse to our Farlib boot. And if I knew my alphabet, this would be much easier. Whoa, what just happened there? Um, there we go. It searched, which was not what I was expecting it to do. Um, so varli, bluebird, yeah, I know. Um, anyways, permissions error again, but um, we would want to set that to our kernel. Do the same thing for our initRD, same thing for our kernel args. Hit the apply and then begin installation and it'll kick off that install. So if you're creating them manually, same exact thing, um, just provide those values inside of there. So the reason why I'm doing it this way is because it's much faster. Um, so you can you can host those files. You can have it Pixie Boot, for example. There, there's a number of different ways of doing it. I find, especially with a, a single libvirt host like this, hosting those on the local local file system makes it tremendously quicker to do the uh, uh, the install process. So at this point, right, we just finished defining all of our virtual machines. So now we can install CoreOS. So I'm gonna do this part manually just so we can see what's going on inside of here. So I'm gonna start with our bootstrap machine and I'm gonna turn it on. So when I turned it on, it did that kernel boot, right? It read in the kernel, it read in the init RD. Uh, now it's going through and it will have read in. So there's all of our uh, kernel command lines, right, all that other stuff. So it reached out and it is pulling down the root FS in the ignition file and it is installing that to the disk for our virtual machine. Now's a good time to say the, the, the reason to look at that boot console is, let's say you fat fingered something and it couldn't pull down one of the images. You'd see it yep. there. Yeah. Yep. So uh, Neil, um, so we have gone through, we've set up um, or staged everything that we need on the helper node. We've created our ignition configs, we've staged those. Um, so at this point, I just installed the bootstrap, um, but we're getting ready to install CoreOS to the rest of them as well. Um, so very much to Justin's point, it's nice to have the console up so we can see if something goes wrong. You'll also notice that once it finished, instead of doing a reboot, it shut down the machine. So that is quite convenient and one of the, one of the things that's nice here. So I'm just going to turn the rest of these on and let them do their thing. Um, I think in the gist, I note, I, I have automation over here. It says just a virtual start um, and then optionally add in a sleep. If you're using slightly slower storage, uh, so this is an NVMe device, uh, you may want to consider staggering these because they can take, uh, they, they will eat up a lot of IO. And I can hear the box that's right on the other side of my monitor here. I can hear it spinning up and begging for Sweet. mercy. mercy. <laughs> nice. Uh, and Neil, we are using static IPs here. So we'll let that guy go through. And here in just a moment, it shuts down. So now we see that all of them have shut back down. So effectively, we now can assume that CoreOS has been installed to all of our nodes. So remember at the very beginning, I said that effectively the install process is super complex. And, and like we've spent, what, an hour now going through all these different steps of staging everything and making sure all our processes are set. Well, now all we do is turn these VMs on and it sets itself up. Um, with one exception, that's approving CSRs. So I do need to go in and I need to remove that config that we had just done. So the reason why it didn't restart when it told it to reboot is because by default, uh, libvirt, when you set the kernel boot, it sets the on reboot to destroy. So it shuts down instead of actually rebooting. Because if we didn't remove those kernel parameters, so if we didn't come in here and remove these, the next time we boot it up, it'll go through and it'll reinstall CoreOS. 
and we don't want that. We want it to boot to the operating system that it just installed. So we'll do a quick round of edits on our virtual machines to take care of that. And now if we look at our VM definition here, you can see our boot options have been removed. And if I check the XML here, our on reboot is now set to restart instead of destroy like it would have been before. So now we simply power it on, right? We can, we can check over here with our, right? So virtual starts. Uh, I'm gonna stagger these just a little bit because they do, um, they, they can be painful. You, you don't technically need to start them. You can start all of them at the same time. Um, so I'm gonna start these four. We'll leave the bootstrap up um, just to see what it's doing there. But what we really care about is a couple of things. Um, so one, at this point, we can use OpenShift install to monitor for the install progress. So all I'm doing is saying, hey, wait for the bootstrap to be complete. Give me all the logs and reference the cluster that is currently being deployed from this particular directory. Uh, so what this will do is it will sit here and it will ping the various APIs. We'll make sure that it's able to connect to things. Um, and we more or less wait. Uh, so I did say that we wanted to see what was going on inside of the bootstrap so that we, we know what it's doing. So I'm gonna open a new window here. Remember I said it was important that we have an SSH key. Uh, so that way we can connect to the node because that is exactly what I want to do at the moment. So I'm going to connect to our node as the core user. And it uses that SSH key that I provided in the install config. And it, the bootstrap dumps me at this command prompt where it very helpfully gives me the name of the command to use uh oh, and it, it just booted me, I think. Yeah. So what happened here, see I was connected to core at bootstrap and then it terminated. That's because it went through and rebooted itself. Um, I was busy running my mouth. Um, what, what happens is uh, on the first boot, it goes through and it uh, instantiates a, uh, uses this release image. Uh, so it goes through and it pulls down the newest RPM OS tree image and then switches to that image and then reboots the node. Um, so that's what we just missed. We'll go ahead and paste this guy. Oops, no, wrong one. So we'll paste this guy in there. So I'm back on the bootstrap machine doing our journal control to look at, in particular, the boot cube is what's going to be doing all, all the work right now. Uh, and it's doing its thing. So at, at this we point... Go ahead, Justin. Well, while we watch the, the bootstrap, I think a couple of points have been brought up, uh, too. One is from um, uh, Neil. He just joined. His question was about UPI uh, and why is it required to use static IP? You, you, met, you talked a little bit about this earlier, but just to repeat why we're doing it this way. So it's not required to use static IP, um, but... I find it to be easier because uh, the alternative is static or, or um, DHCP reservations. So why is that the case? Because our load balancer has to know which nodes are which and how to direct traffic over to them. So we work around this with IPI because like with IPI, when we provision a new node or whatever IP address the node happens to get assigned from you know, the AWS DHCP server or whatnot, the cloud controller will update the load balancer with that node's information. We don't have that with UPI. Remember, there's not that same level of integration with the infrastructure. So instead, we need to have access over to it. Um, why not use DNS? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, we, we, we do use DNS. Um, cool. I think some of this may also go back to why we're doing this install method, which was um, OKD 4.7 has the new automated IPI um, that that will automate a bunch of this uh, versus we are stepping through with you through the essentially un um, not automated, non-integrated installation against Libvirt 
I don't know if that's part of what Neil was asking here. Um, Just to give you background about why we're doing it this way, Neil. So with DHCP host names that have IP assignments, yeah, that yeah, that's expected. But remember, we need a load balancer for uh, the API, for the API internal endpoints, which is really the machine config controller, as well as for the ingress, which is start on apps. Um, so essentially, if we were to do an IP or a UPI rather, and just let DHCP do its thing and do DNS name resolution, we, we would have to rely on the load balancer to be able to do that. Maybe that is possible. Um, I don't think it works with HA proxy. So that is a good point, Neil. Um, some of the more enterprisey load balancers, so I don't know if Citrix or F5 or something like that, can do like a DNS reverse lookup to find the machine on the back end. HA proxy can't, I'll, I'll, um, so your question, so load balancers can't do DNS-based selection. HA proxy, I don't think can. Um, the last time I checked, which I'll admit has been a, like a year ago, it could not, so maybe that's changed. I should probably look into it. Um, but yeah, that that is why I've always done either static IPs or DHCP reservations. So that's a, that is a good point. Justin, I, I see you kind of scowling at the screen. I assume you're looking to find out if it's possible. <laughs> I am, yeah. <laughs> so I, I would, it, you know, it, probably my fault, right? I should have checked, um, you know, it, I should be checking periodically or even um, pinging our partners to see if it's something that they're working on or they can do. Um, instead of, you know, having checked once a while ago and just assuming that it is the way that it is. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm, I'm looking at HA Proxy's site to see what, what they say about uh, integration with DHCP. Um, I think, you know, to, just to give everyone background, Andrew and I kind of went back and forth on this about uh, we we did want to show the most simplified way to install at first, but uh, when we saw that um, the automated integrated installer, for example, that was the first issue then uh, we decided, okay, well, let's let's do the UPI method. And just it provides a more under the covers view. Wouldn't you say, Andrew, you get to really see the mechanisms yeah. that are working, right? Yeah, just definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to do this. I mean, let's not get into even like pixie booting stuff because it, that, even though that's possible and it would definitely get a fleet of nodes operational, we kind of figured this would be, a small group that probably doesn't have enterprisey stuff like Pixie servers and enterprise level load balancers and things like that. So we wanted to try to say, hey, if we do just one box, a Linux box hosting OKD, what is a way that could be streamlined to get it working? So that's what we're showing now. Yeah, I was, as Justin and I were preparing for this, I kept telling him, like, you know, we have, like, this world of possibilities, and this is this is one way out of about 300 of doing it, and it was, I, I switched between them because I try to be familiar with a lot of the different ways, um, so this, it was hard for me to narrow it down. Um, so at this point, kind of in the background here, we're just literally watching paint dry, waiting for this bootstrap to complete. Um, so if we switch over to watching the, the bootstrap logs, so we see we have all of these pod status messages going by. Uh, so these are actually done in groups of four that will repeat. Uh, you can see there's cluster version operator, kube API server, kube scheduler, and kube controller manager. And what we're waiting for is all four of them to be in a status of ready. So here we have running not ready, running not ready. So two readies and two running not readies. So it typically takes a couple of minutes for all four of these to go through. What's happening is, uh, so the bootstrap stands up. It turns on, it reads in that, that ignition config, and among other things, it uses the etcd operator, the, the cluster etcd operator, to instantiate a single node etcd, and then instantiate the cluster or the machine config operator. The control plane nodes then come up, so those three nodes come online, they look to that machine config operator instance, they get their configuration, and then after they configure themselves, they start talking to the bootstrap and the bootstrap says, I'm going to, using the etcd cluster config operator, I'm going to increase my etcd node count to three, so adding two control plane nodes, decrease it to two, removing the bootstrap, and then increase it back to three, bringing it up to the three control plane nodes. 
the bootstrap then hands over all of the Kubernetes control plane operations to the newly instantiated, those three new control plane nodes. So that's effectively what's happening here in the background. That's what we're watching all of these pods, right? All of these messages scroll by. This is it handing over all of that information and waiting for the control plane nodes to take ownership of it. So we can see, right, basically it's done. It's gonna do a, a few more things uh, inside of here. And what we expect to see after a minute or two is this bootstrap to register complete. So knowing that that is almost done, I'm gonna turn on our two worker nodes. So in a moment, what we'll see is this will come back. This, this wait for will end. It will say bootstrap completed after X number of minutes. Over here, we'll see that this log ends and it'll say, you know, boot cube complete or something like that. Uh, at that point, we can power off the bootstrap and we can delete that, that machine if we want. So at this point, what's happened is, and it's going through and you see all of these different YAMLs that are being applied. Uh, so on that new control plane, uh, remember it's just Kubernetes. So it's a Kubernetes control plane uh, the cluster instantiated or deployed operator lifecycle manager, OLM. And it is now using operators to instantiate all of those OKD services. So there, there are boot, our boot cube, boot cube service has succeeded. So at this point, I'm just going to do a simple shutdown. And if we switch over here, see it dinged at me. So it took about 10 minutes for bootstrap to complete. So I'll shut that guy down. And now I want to do a wait for install complete. So same as before, this isn't actually taking any action. It's not reaching out to the cluster just like Bootstrap was and it's not saying, okay, now you need to do this. Okay, now you need to do this. It's just monitoring and reporting back the status of what's going on in the cluster. And we can actually get this information, this right here, this working towards 5% complete, uh, by querying the cluster directly. Uh, so that's what I want to show over here in this one while that's going. So inside of my cluster folder, so remember this is where I placed the ignition or uh, install config file. This is when we created the manifest. It was done inside of here. This is where we have our ignition files when they were generated. Very importantly, we have this off directory. Inside of here are two things. One is the kube admin password. So if you walk away, if you forget to record it or anything like that, the kube admin password is stored in this file. And then the kube config file that we can use to connect as a system admin to the cluster. So all I'm doing is exporting my kube config environment variable to point to that file. And now I can do, remember I have my OC, uh, OC in my path. So now I can do an OC get node against our cluster and it'll reach out and you see it finds the three newly deployed nodes. So at this point um, we have, so control plane is handed over. If I were to do an OC get cluster version, we can see here's our working towards the same thing that we see over here. It's at 88%, it's at 88%. Um, the important thing right now is with UPI, I have to manually say, yes, I recognize that worker node, please let it into the cluster. And we do that by looking for CSRs, certificate signing requests. And you can see I have one that's pending, two that are pending right here. So let's switch back over here to our gist, and you can see I have this two CSRs pending approve them. I have this little shortcut um, that uses, it just queries for them and then pipes it into XARGs to do the OC Adam certificate approve. Um, you can do that manually or I'm lazy, what's that thing about why well, I spent three minutes doing manually, which you can automate in three hours. Um, so we'll do that. Um, I don't know who came up with this. I think it was Christian who originally discovered this. And I think he did literally spend something like two or three hours trying to figure out the Go template to extract <laughs> this specific string. Wow. Um, so the first, it, it will request two of these, one for each one of the nodes. So here's the line, right? You see it's requesting one for each one of the nodes. And then 
Once those are approved, there'll be two additional ones that come up. So here's worker zero. So we need to basically execute that same line again, and it'll approve those CSRs. Now, if I do an OC get node, what I should expect to see is at least one node show up. You can see it's in the not ready status. And I'm, that, that guy is shut down. I'm half wondering if I didn't fork up something over here. 10.66, that's right. Because I thought I saw both of them had the same node name up here, which seems odd. So yeah, worker zero, worker zero. That seems strange that they're both the same. All approved. So I think I must have done something wrong, maybe in my DNS or something like that. So it's two, it's just two references to the same worker node? Uh, it shouldn't be, there should be one for each node. So I'm, I'm not sure why that's not coming up. It could have been something that went wrong. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. Um, but the masters are up. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a strange one. I've never had that happen before, but it's coming up. The cluster will deploy with a single worker. Um, what we'll see is the ingress operator is angry because it wants to have two replicas by default. Um, so we can fix that by just changing it to having one replica. Of course, then it's not highly available, but that's okay. So if we do an OC get cluster operator at this point, we can see all of the different services that OLM is deploying. And we're just waiting. I'm just kind of curious because uh, we have two minutes till the top of the hour. Um, what is the resource utilization looking like on your, your host box, the Libvirt KVM box? Yeah, so this... Uh, so system monitor here. Uh, so usually in idle state with this uh, five node cluster deployed, it's sitting around 40% CPU utilization. You can see it's going up and down uh, because it's still deploying services. And right now, right, it's at 45 gigabytes memory used. Not too bad. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's not as nice as a single node cluster, you know, that fits in, you know, 8, 10, 12 gigabytes of RAM or something like that. Um, but it's, it's certainly usable from a modest size machine. Um, and again, the largest of these is the control plane nodes. I use 16 gigabytes of memory. Uh, I don't think you actually need to use 16 gigabytes. Um, that's, a, that's a habit from OpenShift. If we do a OC get node and OC describe node, on one of our control plane nodes here, way down at the bottom, we have this allocated resources. You can see that requests only total five gigabytes of memory. So that tells me that um, your, your slide that you had shared earlier that has the eight gigabyte RAM, mm -hmm. that, would, that would work, right? Because um, usually the biggest issue is not the node is actually using five gigabytes of memory, but rather it needs at least five gigabytes of memory to be able to allocate to pod requests. And eight gigabytes should be more than enough to satisfy both the requests as well as real resource utilization inside of those nodes. But what's interesting to, to see is you were already up to about 45 gig. So that exceeds the, the you know, people get an idea for the, the floor here if it, they're doing multi-node, we we have uh, four or five, depending. I, I would suspect at least two of those gigabytes are Firefox. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, here we can find. Oh, it's wait! Not, I thought you were running Chrome, though. Running uh, so it it depends on where I'm at. Uh, so remember, I'm sharing a VNC session into oh. my Fedora box and yeah. the, the, my desktop is Mac OS. 
Uh, and typically for work-related things, because uh, Red Hat uses the Google suite, I use Chrome just because Google likes to play in, inside baseball with their stuff, and it just works better. So um, now that the the nodes are, are booting up and uh, the operators are coming online, oh, I see Diane uh, joining back here. I think this is a really good time to just take a, a moment, um, maybe for recap any any Q and A that we have. Um, how are things going, uh, Diane, in the other sessions? We yeah. have had okay. success um, in the home in the home lab groups. They got three different home lab deployments walked through and demoed. Amazement. Um, and in the the um, which one was the one that just um, ended? Um, you, you guys are bare metal. So it was the vSphere folks finished theirs. And um, they did cut out a little bit early because it was going to be another 10 to 20 minutes of staring at the screen to watch an upgrade. Um, so those two are done. Um, and, you know, just keep on keeping on as, as you want to. Um, and what I'm curious about is if there's things um, that people who are listening in here um, think that we should be adding to the documentation besides your documentation, Andrew, in your GIST file, which I'm going to uh, get you to make a pull request against El Maiko's um, repo sometime today so we can get that in. Right, so how, how has it been going over here? Is it I, I've probably been running my mouth too much, explaining various nuances instead of... Uh, so it's funny because if I just go through and, and deploy a cluster um, in my lab, it takes about 40 minutes in the end, and you notice we're at two hours, and that's Andrew running his mouth. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, that's explaining. Uh, I, I, th 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 this is awesome, again, Andrew, because the, you're... I, I've noticed that um, first timers, whether it's OKD or OpenShift, the the docs uh, can really lead you astray. So, Diane, I think this is a great effort to have uh, maybe more streamlined or verbose documents on deployment of OKD because it, it, you know, you, you explaining the process is kind of what's missing in some of the documentation, Andrew. Yeah, so I, I'll also say that, um, so it's funny, my team, um, the tech marketing team, we have a bi-weekly meeting with the UX group um, where they just go through and say, hey, this is what we've been working on. You guys interact with a lot of customers. What do you think? Um, so one of the things that we've been trying to set up is basically the same thing with the docs folks. Um, you know, I, I tend to specialize on the install process and kind of the day two administrative process. Um, so I have a lot of feedback for them about how to better organize install docs and all that. Um, so it'd be it would be great to to get that better organized. Yeah, no, yeah, you know, nobody's going to argue about that. Um, our, our our documentation is always a work in progress. Um, I think this we're going to try and do these um, hop in sessions um, or some variation on it, like once a quarter. Um, and I think we're also going to try on Thursdays to have like open office hours for OKD that is that are all community driven. So this has been this this is really useful for us um, who are in the working group. And if I, I know I probably I'm speaking to the converted because I think all of you who are I can see online here now are all in the working group um, now. Um, and if you're not uh, Kareem, if you're here and you're not coming, uh, it, it's it's usually just a um, uh, skeleton. If you haven't joined yet, do so. Um, that does. It's usually a time zone issue, too. Um, I think we have people from um, all over the world trying to come in and, and see this stuff. But the working group has been great in terms of giving feedback and stepping up and doing stuff. So, um, yeah, my my heart of hearts, I would love to get one product manager from the OpenShift team to, to come on a regular basis to these just to hear um, some of the things that people are, are doing. Um, and, and I think a lot of the PMs are also deploying home labs and things like that. And um, I think I heard a, heard a, a threat that um, all of them have to ma manage the internal cluster for a period of time, each PM. It's, uh, um, not, it's not a threat. It is a reality. Um, I know. Yeah, we, we actually, um, right now we're going through a process of pairing product managers with tech marketing managers um, because I, I love our product managers, and they are 
extremely knowledgeable and deeply technical on their focus areas. And having them branch out and learn more about OpenShift as a whole is nothing but amazingly positive. So um, I, I've already seen some benefits there. Um, they're, they're, they've already experienced some pain trying to set up uh, authentication. <laughs> so, so they've already created some Jira issues themselves saying, this is way too hard. We, we should make this easier. Yeah. So it's really, it, and, and I think, and, and I will make all of the, the recordings of these sessions available to everybody to use. Uh, it does take 24 hours to render all of these videos. So if you're, you know, anxiously waiting for it, um, it probably, and my internet got restored um, as of Monday morning um, at my house. I will be able to upload them on Wednesday or on Monday afternoon. So look for them there and I'll, I'll make a post to the mailing list um, when they're there. But um, this stuff is just hugely useful for everybody. Um, and we're just really grateful for you guys' time. So I'm going to leave you to finishing this. Go pop into the other session and see how they're doing. And um, then I'll pop back here and we'll just keep going back and forth until you finish your deployment here. OK. Thank you, Diane. So. Uh, while we were chatting there, if you were watching my screen, I found out where the issue with the uh, the single worker zero name is here. Uh, so up when I was doing this variable assignment, I did not replace that one, uh, which then propagated down into the others. So they do have distinct IPs, right? All that other stuff, they just have the same host name. Um, hmm. I don't I don't know how that's affecting Open or uh, OKD. Um, it may may not like it, it may be okay with it. Um, so if we end up not deploying, that could be one of the reasons why. Yeah, John, you're right. You, you can't register the same host name. So I'm, what I need to do is, uh, let's see, get node dash O wide. I need to see which one it actually is. Um, so worker zero 65. Uh, so I think that means that I can shut down the other one, um, which would be worker one running with 66. We'll do that and see if it, what's interesting is you see the CPU usage is, is up there. So it feels like it's doing something, even though it shouldn't be doing something. <laughs> so I don't know what it's, what's going on there, but we'll turn it off. We'll see what the cluster does. Yeah, I do remember when they were all Fedora. But yep, just waiting, watching this thing go through and do its thing. So you can a lot of times see authentication. That one worries me. Um, that, that could be because we only have the one node. Um, I know what I could do. I could reload that node. because all I need to do to reload the node is come in here to the boot options and repopulate these. So And that would work, I mean, you're, you'd pass it those parameters on boot, but that would work why? Uh, so I, I'm going to set the node name correctly this time. So here, so oh, the, the issue is, right, because remember we did static um, static IP config and we set the node name here. Uh, so what I need to do is, because you can't really change the IP address or host name of an, a, a, a CoreOS node easily, uh, really, the recommendation is treat it like an appliance, blow it away, right, and, and reload it. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Um, so I'm just going to, rather than doing it all automated from the CLI like I did before, I'm just going to do it manually from here. So we'll paste this guy in here and then jump back. No, I can't control to jump by more than one at a time. So we'll set this to oops, one. And that should be the only change that we need to make on that particular line. What was the typo again? Was it in the... Um... 
Yeah, so if we come back over here, so in step six of the gist, where I set the variable for worker one, I did, I did not substitute the correct node name. Okay, I got it. So we'll set that guy there. Um, where'd you go? So hit apply there. And then I don't think... Oh, where are the preferences? I can never remember. Detail. You got to go to detail. Oh, what preferences are you looking for? Sorry. So I can edit XML. Oh, yeah. Because I want to set it so that it will do the destroy on reboot again. Okay. So we'll turn it on. This time, instead of booting to the already installed CoreOS, it's going to boot to that kernel parameters that we provided, and it's going to reload CoreOS on this node. So you can see now it's going through the process of writing that out. It'll take just a moment. Let's check on this guy while we're here. Oh, look, it finished. So 17 and a half minutes. Woo! It spit nice. out our kubadmin password. Very nice. So remember, this okd.lan doesn't exist outside of this box. And remember, I set that domain using the system control or system D resolve D. Um, so let's paste that in there. And we get our lovely Firefox. I like the Chrome one where you have to type, this is unsafe. Have you done that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> yeah, with, with Chrome, when it doesn't like the certificate, it forces you to literally type into the browser, this is unsafe, instead of clicking that I accept the risk button. That's a change since I stopped using Chrome. Okay. There we go. There's our nice. cluster. It is um, it is a 4.6 cluster, so an upgrade is available, but we're good to go. And let's check on our other worker node while we have a moment. You can see, so it, it started and installed and then it stopped. So let's flip this back to restart and apply. And then on our boot options, we uncheck this and apply. And then we'll start our node. And just like during the install process, what's gonna happen is it'll turn on It'll come up. It already has its network config and everything. It'll look to the machine config operator. So that API int, you can see it trying to get to it from here. So it pulled down its ignition config and now it's going through and it's trying to, it'll reconfigure itself here in a moment. It will reboot again because it pulled down a new uh, RPM OS tree. So it's gonna flip over to the new one and then it'll reboot. And then at that point is when uh, we should have to approve the CSR for it to join the cluster. But that'll take but a bigger, minutes. bigger thing. I mean, that was just a typo. The bigger thing is the console is up. Yeah, console's up. You can see we do have an, a, a degraded operator. That's the ingress. So remember, I said with only one worker node, it will deploy. You'll just have the ingress will be angry because there's a. It wants by default to be scaled to two, um, and that means that there needs to be two worker nodes available for it. So. Um, this is this is great. I I think this is where uh, I totally get that um, you wanted to see that second worker node up, but uh, it, you successfully showed us the deployment of OKD. I think we had um, some good questions so far. Any questions that uh, folks have that just joined us or had been sticking with us from the get go about the install to to um, we used uh, Andrew used Fedora here. Any any questions that still don't make sense? Yeah, John, you're correct. Um, I, I could create a brand new VM, do the exact same process, and add as many worker nodes as I need to into the cluster. So, and you can uh, you can use DHCP, just uh, the static IPs. So, our uh, DHCP reserv reservations. So after creating the VM, right, check out the NIC and make a, a reservation. Um, so I can show you an example of that because, so this is my self-contained OKD libvirt lab. I actually have a, a bigger quote unquote lab, a separate lab by reuse hosts. 
um, where I do pixie booting um, and I use DHCP reservations there. So if we sh to here, So this, this helper node is running bind, it's running uh, DHCPD, right, all those other things. So if I go to, instead of DNS mask, and inside of here, you can see, because I was also prepared to do this from, so in this demo, what I did was connected it to that internal libvirt only network. I could also bridge it to my external network. Um, so if you were sharp-eyed when I was reviewing my, my stuff here, under the virtual networks, I have this BR0, and it just connects directly out to the same network as the rest of my, my host. So if we had wanted to, I could show, you know, doing it from there. And you see, I just have these uh, DHCP reservations set up for each one of them. Uh, and then just as with the other one, I have an HA proxy config for that. And then I have, if we go to var name D, and then I have a bind uh, zone for that, for those particular hosts inside of there. Same exact thing in that instance, um, and especially, uh, uh, what host do I need? This host, so if I go to, so if I want to go to, there we go, TFTP boot. So if you're familiar with Pixie, you can actually have it based off of the MAC address, automatically boot nodes. So in my, uh, when, when I normally, because I churn through, especially OpenShift clusters, sometimes three or four a day um, when I'm creating demos and stuff like that. Um, so all I have to do is turn on my VMs and then hit escape and tell it to Pixie Boots and walk away from it and come back. And half an hour later, I have a fully new cluster um, that's been deployed. So you can absolutely have it do, do that. So if we do a... Cat on, on the fi side. final note of this, because uh, we're going through the the details of like adding in an alternate method, Pixie booted. Um, I'm kind of curious. You, you also said that you would need to approve a CSR, right? So it's not just the node boots, but someone, some operator has to approve. Yeah. So with with UPI, regardless of the of the platform that you're using, you always have to approve the CSRs for the for newly uh, or, or nodes that you want to join. So, oops. So that would be the third point, uh, John, to your question. Yeah, so there's, see how I have a pending one? So if you were, again, quick-eyed with my worker one here, see how it's only been up for like 30 seconds? My, my cursor disappears, but it's only been up for a minute or two because it, it booted and then it got the new RPM OS tree image and then applied that and rebooted and then it came up and now it wants to join the cluster. So now I need to approve this CSR. I do a find my XARGs thing here. So I'll approve that CSR so we can see here the pending one. So this is node bootstrapper is the first thing that will request one for each new node. And then we'll give it a second and we should see another pending show up after just a second. Um, and these CSRs, they do disappear after I think 24 hours. They'll automatically disappear from the list. There, here's our pending. And we see it's for worker one this time. So we'll do the same approve. And now if I go to OC get node, we have our worker one. Awesome. So, and that'll, it'll go through, it'll deploy all the various services, eventually ingress controller, right? The, the operator will say, hey, wait, there's a new node and it'll deploy another ingress uh, a router. And then that error or this, uh, let me make that bigger and then let me make this bigger. And then this operator being angry on, now it's, that one's updating because of the new node. But the ingress will eventually stop being angry and it'll, then we have two nodes to lay yep. its stuff on. So, and if we look here, so yes, this is also upset. That's because we just added the new node and therefore it's going through and all of those operators are going to adjust for the new node and deploy additional services. Uh, once that new node is fully joined, it'll go back into a healthy, happy status and it'll be ready to go. 
Uh, one thing to note with 4.7, uh, if your machine config pool is unhappy, so for example, in this instance, there's a node that's uh, not ready, it won't allow you to do updates. So. So back to the deployment documentation uh, that Diane had mentioned, um, it sounded like you wanted to make a few uh, edits or, or changes to your deployment doc before you submitted it. Yeah, so I do need to make one edit. Um, so over here, uh, this is a, a bug in my documentation. This is what led to that one worker node not being valid. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, I don't know if we, it, it, it can be added as is, um, or we can incorporate it into a larger thing. I'm, I'm happy either way. Well, let's do this. Let's get you to um, make a pull request on Mike's stuff today so I can at least get one new chunk of a docs in there. And then we will get people to comment on it. So that would be wonderful if we could get that one in and that would make Diane's day. There we go. All the operators are happy. If we come back down here to our cluster settings, we can see, oh, I say that it would allow me to update. It will after a minute, but uh, deployment's good. We're ready to start testing. And now that Validate. all of them, one one last check on the resources on your box, now that the, the second node is you know, really building out. As you can see, I, idle state right now, so there are 48 gigabytes of RAM, uh, somewhere between 40 and 60% of CPU. And this is an older CPU. It's a Ryzen 5 2600. So that's four years old now, three years old now, something like that. So, and then the network is, that's, uh, I know it's super hard to read. It's tiny for me to even read. That's right around two megabits or two megabytes per second. So that's 16 megabits. So with five VMs running a, a, a cluster, I mean, this is a, a, a decent size. Like you said, older hardware, someone can spin this up if they have wherever, where they work or if it's home lab. I mean, this is, uh, you, you don't have to break the bank to spin this up on something like a Linux box. Yeah, re really the, the only investment, quote unquote, that I did is uh, an NVMe device. Um, I think I spent, $80 on a 512 gigabyte NVMe device, uh, PCIe NVMe device. Um, just make sure that your motherboard is capable of plugging those in. And it's it solved all of the performance deployment issues, right? You saw it took us, what, less than 30 minutes total to deploy the cluster. Before that, I was trying to use, uh, uh, I had a LVM device with LVM cache, so it was, two spinning drives and a RAID 1 with uh, an SSD cache. And it would deploy, but you couldn't really do anything with it. And the deployment took the better part of an hour instead of half an hour. Um, so yeah, I, I asked and my wife was very kind and said, sure, that's, <laughs> it saves you time. That's good. Authorization to purchase. That's great. Yeah. I, uh, so I don't see any more questions in the chat, um, and the the cluster is up. You you showed us that. Um, I think we had a great uh, chat back and forth, and totally understand about uh, the document. Um, wanting to get that up to so that other people can can run through this, it would be great because uh, I think it's very clear, well written, and now they have this recording to step through it as well if they have a question. Yeah, I think this this was excellent. This is this is like the perfect way to um, end the end the day with uh, this up and running. And um, I think you guys nailed it on the head here. So thank you so much for taking the time today. I, I know it's a Saturday. It may, it, we may all be down in lockdown and that, but I you know you still need to go out for a walk and get some fresh air now, wherever you are. I think you're East Coasters, both of you, Andrew and Justin. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's still a little light out there in the background, even though you're probably in your basements, um, as I am. So um, I'm not seeing any other questions. John, thank you for joining us and sticking with us all day and all your wonderful um, feedback. Um, love this. And so when we do this again next quarter, 
uh, John and other folks, we're going to get you guys to do walkthroughs like this. Um, you don't talk too much. That's why we put you in chat. Um, <laughs> between you and Neil, John, that's uh, yeah. That, both of you are going to have to be on the hook for the next one. So I'd like to do these um, like once a quarter. Um, something, you know, as because depending on the release cadence for OKD, but this really is very, very helpful. And if people have any um, issues um, that they want to do against the, the documentation, that would be great. If there was a platform or a target that we didn't hit, um, throw a, um, an issue that just adds a stub or make a pull request for that, a stub on that and in the, in the repo. And we will endeavor either to make you do it or find people who will collaborate with you and um, make it happen. Um, this is, it's really been great. I think the feedback people are giving is just wonderful. So thank you both for doing this today. Um, thank you, Andrew, especially because uh, he was up late last night with a couple of issues with the installer. Um, I, I saw my chat pretty late uh, that he, he was banging away at the keyboard getting a couple Aww. things fixed. I right. don't mind. It, it's it's a lot of fun. And like I said, I, I learned a few things today. So um, it, it's it's awesome. worth it for me. So thank you. Awesome. Well, you're getting thunderous applause and clapping in the chat. So well done. And we will see you all at the next OKD working group meeting. And...